Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about some uh, uh, efforts that have been going on in our group here about uh, trying to model uh, mass transfer binaries. And of course, when we talk about mass transfer binaries, there are multiple challenges involved. We want to know what happens to the uh, accretor as a result of mass transfer. Sometimes the accretor, of course, you might imagine will expand rapidly if you're dumping too much mass onto it. We might want to know what happens to the donor as a consequence of mass transfer. The donor will no longer be evolving in the same way that a single star would evolve. Sometimes mass transfer becomes dynamically unstable, and we want to understand what happens in the context of dynamically unstable mass transfer, otherwise known as a common envelope phase. And so I'll try to mention briefly um, some of the ongoing progress on all of these fronts. And uh, but first, I wanted to borrow a slide from uh, uh, Nicholas, who kindly sent me this this awesome Pikachu slide. And so in, in Nicholas's version, you start out with the real thing, and then you go and sequentially approximate it with the uh, simpler and simpler models. In my personal trajectory in the space, I actually went in the other direction. I started by being interested in binary black hole mergers. No stars involved. Look, two compact objects, hard enough uh, to figure out. My uh, The start of my PhD was trying to solve the binary black hole problem uh, in general relativity. Of course, fortunately, Franz Pretorius, who was sitting next door, solved it first because uh, I was uh, not getting anywhere close. Um, and then I decided, well, since you know I'm not good enough at uh, doing uh, just two simple point particles, I'll try to do all the complicated mess uh, that leads to that. And so I started going sort of in the opposite direction, uh, first getting involved in some rapid binary population synthesis because I figured that that would be the way to ultimately understand the consequences of gravitational wave observations initially, then got interested in other observations too. I learned from uh, uh, Chris Bluchinski how to do this, who sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago, um, and uh, then sort of realized that, well, rapid binary population synthesis is uh, a wonderful tool. Uh, you come up with an incredibly simple model, kind of like that uh, line drawing with Pikachu, and that may have very little reflection or relation to reality. So you really have to start going the other way in order to identify what's going on in some of the more complex phases of binary evolution. So it's sort of, for me, been a gradual journey in, from the right to the left. Um, and, you know, this was many years ago, I showed the slide of, you know, what happens when you try to imagine rapid binary population synthesis, and there are lots of uncertainties everywhere, starting with the uh, where you start with the initial mass function and distribution of parameters of your binaries, going on to how much mass is lost in winds, what happens in a supernova, although Daniel has just explained to us some of what happens in a supernova, what happens in a common envelope phase, that's all question marks because it's so messy, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the only place where I don't have question marks is the gravitational waves because uh, you know, I thought those were pretty simple and a solved problem, although Keegan is just saying that, that even there, there are some questions. Um, so, um, let me try to just very briefly address some of these questions, which we're now trying to understand in a little bit more detail. So one of them is uh, the very important question of what happens when you add a hamster and a star? Well, of course, you get a hamster. Right. <laughs> All right. The, I apologize for the very silly pun, but the reason we um, were interested in hamsters is we were interested in what happens when you feed a star too fast. In other words, imagine you're trying to feed a star on a time scale that is much shorter than the thermal time scale of the accretor. You're donating mass to a star very rapidly, feeding the star from a fire hose. What does the star do? Well, it cannot immediately radiate away all of this energy, so it has to start to expand. And the question is, how much does it expand? And in particular, the standard law often used in rapid binary population synthesis is that, well, okay. It, it's all about the relative rate of mass feeding relative to the rate at which a star can absorb mass, which you can sort of think of as a, you know, the mass of the star divided by its thermal time scale, the Kelvin, Kelvin Helmholtz time scale of the star. So, you know, maybe there's some fixed prefactor between those two, but that's how much a star can absorb, how fast a star can absorb mass. And we said, well, maybe that's not quite what happens physically, right? Because first, for a while, the ham star can just puff up its cheeks and stuff mass behind its cheeks. How big are its cheeks? Well, its cheeks are as big as the size of the Roche lobe of the accretor. 
until the creature feels its rosh lobe, it can probably successfully stuff mass behind its cheeks. Only when it fills its rosh lobe, only at that point does the mass cancer become non-conservative. So we really need to model exactly how the radius of the accretor is responding to mass gain, even when the mass gain is very rapid. And so Mike Lau, working with uh, Rio Hira and Chris Stout, uh, has been doing some very nice models. Now, some of you may say that these models are fairly familiar. If you know papers, for example, from uh, 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 Meyer Hoffmeister and Kippenhahn from uh, the 1970s, they have uh, actually plots that look quite a bit like this, but we try to understand things in a little bit, perhaps more detail, at least get some intuition and maybe even try to come up with some fits to what's going on here. And I'm not going to have time to describe all of the details, but suffice it to say that as a star is accreting, um, so these are stars of different masses, and here we're just assuming spherical accretion, so we're not worrying about stellar rotation, for example, which is an important thing. This is not some 3D simulation. It's all 1D, all done with MESA. But our stars, as you go from blue to green, blue, orange, yellow, etc., all the way up to green, the, the mass accretion rate is going up. Um, when the mass accretion rate is small, the stars just pop up a little bit off of the main sequence and promptly return to the main sequence. When the mass accretion rate gets very large, they move all the way over to the right on the Kurtzman Russell diagram, and they actually start rising up the Hayashi track. Uh, essentially, they're, at that point, their luminosity is just set by the Eddington limit for the stars. Um, and when do the stars turn around and move back towards the main sequence track? Well, it happens at a time when the rate of energy release from gravitational settling from the accretion equals the luminosity at which the maximum luminosity at which the stars can radiate away this extra energy. and so what Mike has done is he has actually put together some very nice fits, and they're described in the paper. I'm not going to talk about them in any detail, but stars, when they accrete very rapidly, they sort of move towards the Hayashi track, which here on this maximum radius versus uh, mass accretion rate is shown with uh, this black line. And we have a uh, fit to what's happening there, whereas stars that don't come Close to Hayashi track, they actually follow this fairly self-similar behavior, which we can also describe and fit in terms of their radial evolution. And there's actually, interestingly, a pretty strong bifurcation, although the bifurcation depends on the mass of the accretor between stars that just expand a little bit and then promptly shrink back down and therefore can accrete fairly conservatively as long as they can stay within their Oslo. And stars that really extend all the way to the Hayashi track so those are shown in red in the spot on the right. And uh, so if you exceed the mass, the maximum mass accretion rate of the uh, accretor by too high of a factor, then you really go all the way to the Roche lobe, which in most practical cases, all the way to the Hayashi track, which in most practical cases will mean Roche lobe overflow and will mean non-conservative mass transfer. Okay, next, uh, we talked about what happens to the accretors. Let's very briefly mention what happens to donors. So... This is work in PrEP led by Minori Shikauchi. And uh, uh, Minori has been exploring what happens to stars as they lose mass. And this is in particular a question for main sequence stars. So the reason that it's a particular question for us for main sequence stars is that we're using rapid binary population synthesis where the typical approach is to say that, well, whenever a star loses mass on the main sequence, it just moves to one of the pre-existing, pre-built tracks of stars that start at zero age in the main sequence and evolve forward with no mass loss. Which means if I take a 20 more solar mass star and I remove 10 solar masses from it, my star now behaves like a 10 solar mass star at a different phase in its evolution. So we can adjust the phase in the evolution, but all they have are tracks of stars that start at zero age main sequence and evolve forward. And of course, the 20 solar mass star that loses mass late in its evolution on the main sequence looks nothing like a 10 solar mass star. And so we try, we're now trying to correct for that behavior. And in particular, um, Minori has made some um, very nice fits, again, based on single stellar evolution models to what, how the uh, mass of the core um, and the luminosity of these stars will evolve on mass loss. And, and you can see here um, that, uh, okay, these things are parameterized by 
uh, the uh, central helium fraction uh, at the time of mass loss, but you can basically see that there are fits here, which are shown in dashed lines and actual MESA models shown in solid lines. They're excellent fits because Minori has been able to figure out what's uh, going on here and, and come up with some nice solutions. But also there are some interesting observations, for example, like the fact that the almost independent of the mass, something I at least didn't realize before, the convective core for non-mass transferring stars shrinks by almost the same fraction. So the convective, therefore, it's roughly by the end of the terminal age, by terminal age main sequence, the convective core has uh, uh, shrunk to about 60% of its initial mass coordinate almost for massive stars, almost regardless of the mass. Okay, and how much time do I have left? Um, so very quickly, uh, common envelope evolution. Uh, I promise there will be some 3D as well because we're moving from right to left. So this is a very nice simulation um, run by Mike Lau, who used to be a PhD student here, is now in Heidelberg, uh, working with Rio and Daniel Price and others. Um, and Mike has been doing some detailed modeling of uh, uh, hydrodynamical modeling of uh, common envelope evolution. I'm not going to be able to talk about Mike's results. I will just say that um, okay, this is a beautiful spiral in. Gradually, uh, the initially slow spiral, and then eventually you'll see that once the companion really plunges into the envelope, you'll see over just a few orbits a really dynamical in spiral uh, until eventually the companion stalls um, around here. Um, and um, some of these simulations, as well as some uh, uh, 1D work have inspired Rio to come up with a different prescription for uh, common envelope evolution outcomes. There's something called the classical alpha formalism, which is an energy conserving formalism. You basically say the amount of energy the binary should lose is equal to the amount of energy it takes to unbind the envelope. Um, Rio has pointed out that this, while this may work for low mass stars, it doesn't really work for massive stars. Um, there are multiple reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that massive stars have a significant radiative intershell region between the core and the envelope, and that region does not respond on this very rapid dynamical time scale. Uh, it will only re-expand on a thermal time scale, and you cannot really treat thermal time scale mass transfer adiabatically because energy is not being conserved. Stars have time to radiate away that energy, and uh, uh, this, of course, impacts the final outcomes. And one of the ongoing uh, projects, which hopefully will be submitted later this week, is some work by Louis Picker, who was an honor student here, working with Rio and myself, um, where Louis has been trying to model uh, exactly how much mass is in this radiative intershell, uh, doing so quite successfully, as you can see on the bottom left. Um, uh, there are some, he realized that there are some very self similar uh, curves as long as you plot the a mass in this, uh, uh, well, the fraction of the mass in the convective envelope as a function of this effective temperature parameter. Uh, and you can also uh, uh, get some pretty self-similar results for uh, that allow you to have simple fits for the binding energy in the outer convective envelope. And so you can treat uh, things using this two-stage prescription where the outer convective envelope you remove using this alpha lambda formalism, using energy conservation, the uh, radiative intershell you treat uh, as thermal time scale stable mass transfer. And so stay tuned. We're about to consider the impacts of all of these results on binary populations, um, hopefully trying to understand some of the ongoing challenges with reproducing things like gravitational wave sources, low mass extra binaries, etc. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. I'm asking about the effect of one of the mechanisms, uh, <clears throat> namely the the fact that this, the, the equator would grow as a response, uh, eventually it would feel its Roche law. The other star is also feeling its Roche law, right? So they would reach contact at this phase, and what would happen then? It's a very good question, what will happen then? Um, I'm not sure we actually know the answer to this. Um, our assumption is that uh, at this point, the mass transfer becomes um, uh, non-conservative, so you start losing mass. Now, one interesting ongoing question is whether you lose, what is the angular momentum being carried away by the mass we have lost, right? So um, uh, there is, uh, again, one of the default assumptions is you lose mass, for example, with the specific angular momentum of the accretor. Uh, this is something called isotropic remission in the literature. It's entirely possible that in this particular case, that's not in fact what happens, is the amount of angular momentum you lose is much larger. It may be something like the 
angular momentum from the L2 Lagrange point because it's sort of overflowing the outer on the on the back side of the Roche lobe, if you wish. Sorry, I don't have a suitable picture to show this. Um, and that's actually some that's has a very significant consequence for binary evolution. So a former student here, uh, Reinhold Wilcox, working with uh, Morgan McLeod, uh, Rian myself, has explored the impact of what will happen if you change the amount of angular momentum lost in this non-conservative mass transfer. But we don't actually know yet what is the right amount. And I think that's uh, something that uh, you know, we're look, trying to figure out how to explore uh, using more detailed models. It's actually not easy to do in this case because even 3D Hydro, I think, is going to struggle with this, this problem because the total amount of mass in the accretion stream is actually very low relative to the total amount of mass present, so it's hard to resolve. So, but I think that's a that's an ongoing open question. Okay, um, sorry, I think we're over time now. Um, so is Thomas the next speaker? So we'll do the change over. Yep. I'm going to stop sharing slides in a moment. Sorry.